that, at that night, as they reclined around the table with those two disciples who he had just taught all the Torah and the prophets to, then he took that matzah in his hand, because it's now the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And he said that same prayer of thanksgiving to God, and then he said, This is my body, which was broken for you. He broke it, laid the matzah on the table, and just like that, disappeared out of their sight. And they just leaped up from the table because they knew it's the Messiah, it's the Lord. And they said, did not our hearts burn within us as He walked with us by the way and as He opened our understanding to the Scriptures. And they took off on a dead run back to Jerusalem. The door that they had slammed just hours before, they burst through the door and now they are so excited and now they begin telling Him what had transpired that they had just seen the resurrected Messiah. And he had just interpreted the Torah and the prophets and then he had just fulfilled it. As they were beginning to tell the story, then the Messiah appeared in their midst and said, Shalom, Shalom, peace. And it says that he then opened their understanding in the Torah and in the prophets and in all the ketubim, the other scriptures concerning what he had just fulfilled. He opened their understanding. The word understanding in the Greek is the word synesis. And the word synesis is described in Greek literature as the point at which two rivers come together. Like in America, the Monongahela and the Allegheny come together at Pittsburgh, and at the point they come together to form the mighty Ohio River, that is the synesis. And it is all of our lives that we've had these different streams in our mind. All this information that's come to us all of our lives. As we've read the Gospels, as we've read the different Scriptures. But what is going to happen as we now teach the Feast of the Lord, that you are going to see all those things that at one time seemed to be disjointed, that you really didn't know how to put together, they will come together into a mighty river. It will change your life because you will have sunasis. You will have understanding because the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, will give you that understanding as He opens to you these very Scriptures. And now, as the Scripture says, the law or the Torah having a shadow of good things to come. It is a shadow of good things to come embedded in the Torah, in the instructions, and that is why we call this first session Bible Prophecy 101. We're going to go right back to the beginning and see how these things now will make sense as we go back into the Scriptures. And we begin with Jeremiah, and in the 16th chapter and the 14th verse and following, it says, Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I will bring the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands whither I have driven them. And it says, O Lord, my strength and my fortress, my refuge in the day of affliction. In the day of affliction. In the last days when Israel comes back into their own land, it is at that time that in the day of affliction, the Gentiles shall come unto the Israel from the ends of the earth and shall say. The word say is a little weak here because it is cry out in repentance. The Gentiles shall come unto thee in the day of affliction, which is about upon us, and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies. Our fathers have inherited vanity in things wherein there is no profit. You know, if your fathers inherited lies, then what they would pass down to you would be lies, and they wouldn't even know it. Nor would you know it, because it was inherited. It was passed down to you. Remember that... As Stephen said, our fathers received the living oracles to give unto us. There are also the Gentiles, it says, that they have inherited lies. And they will repent and cry out, we've inherited lies. We've inherited things that do not profit. Shall a man make gods unto himself that are no gods? And that's what had happened. As I began to describe Easter, the goddess of fertility which all the rest of the world knows that this is the Babylonian uh, goddess of fertility. But yet, the name Easter is spoken in churches in America when the commandment of God is, Thou shalt not let the name of other gods come out of your mouth. It is a commandment. 
The Deuteronomy says, God says, do not learn the way of the heathen, do not learn how they serve their gods, and do so, and worship me in the same way, and do so unto me. He said, is, is an abomination, which is one of the harshest words in the entire Hebrew language. It means utterly repulsive, repugnant, disgusting, putrid, and vile. That's what abomination is. And that is what God says if you learn the way of the heathen and do the same things and say you're doing it to him. It is utterly repulsive to him. And some will say, well, that's not what it means to me. Well, I don't worship you. I don't care what it means to you. What it means to God is the only thing that matters. And if he calls it repulsive and vile and repugnant, then I would suggest that you get in alignment with God and call it the same thing. And it doesn't matter what family members don't like what you're doing, unless they're God, those family members, then do the will of God. Now it says, Therefore, because the Gentiles cry out in repentance, therefore, behold, I, God, will this once cause them, the Gentiles, to know which means to understand. I will cause the Gentiles to know by experience my hand and experience my might. And they, the Gentiles, in the last days shall know that my name is the Lord, is what it says in the King James. But every time you see capital L-O-R-D in the Scriptures, in the English language, in the Hebrew, it is always yod Hey vav Hey. It is the name of the Lord, Yahweh. The holy name of Yahweh, which is not to be spoken in vain, not to be spoken for your own glory or for your own purposes. It is the name of God, Yahweh. And it says that in the last days, God will cause the Gentiles who cry out in repentance to know His name. See, the Lord is simply a title given to every British landowner for the last thousand years. But, Yahweh is the name of God. Nearly 7,000 times the name of the Lord, Yahweh, appears in the Hebrew Scriptures. But following a Jewish tradition that teaches that the name is too holy to pronounce, the King James translators substituted the indistinct title, the Lord, but they did it in all capitals so that you would know that whenever you come to that word, capital L-O-R-D, or capital G, capital O, capital D, in the Hebrew, it is always the name of the Lord, which is Yahweh. yod He vav He. So we know that when the English version says, praise the name of the Lord, what does it say in Hebrew? Praise the name of Yahweh. When it says, bless the name of the Lord, you'd say, okay, I'd like to. What's the name of the Lord? Because in Hebrew it says, bless the name of Yahweh. Nearly 7,000 times it occurs. But yet we have not been taught. And all it takes is just repentance. We've inherited some lies. We've inherited things that do not profit. And God says if we repent. And that's all you can do when you've inherited lies. You can't beat yourself up for your entire life. You just say, okay, I admit it. I inherited some lies. I want to know the truth. I've received the love of the truth, and I can't get enough of it. Give me some more. I'll obey whatever you teach me.